A lot of people are upset that their feed-in tariffs for their excess solar generation from their roof gets exported for, I believe in Victoria, it's close to zero. In New South Wales, it's a few cents, but it's definitely far less than it used to be. When I first got solar, it was well over 10 cents. It might've been 15 cents. Every year it drops, but that's actually a good thing, isn't it, Richard? Can you explain why? Yeah, prices have dropped because wholesale prices have dropped. So to arguing for higher feed-in tariffs is in effect arguing for a higher wholesale electricity price. Please contribute. It really helps my independent, honest journalism. Today we're with Richard from New Energy Thinking. What he does is home and business assessments as well as councils and other governments. So he looks at the whole building and tells people what they can do to improve the sort of thermal performance. In, in terms of that sentiment about things being unfair, people home in on the feed-in tariff. And, and I don't want to come across as someone sort of being a shield for big energy, because I do think there are problems. But just low feed-in tariff is not the problem people think it is. I mean, in terms of retail behaviour, I think there are significant problems. And basically, the only reason there are all these new electricity plans from different companies where it's electricity is free between 10 and 1 or several hours in the middle of the day is because solar sort of experiment in Australia has worked. And there's millions and millions of homes and businesses exporting so much solar in the middle of the day that there's more solar than is actually needed by people using power and therefore in terms of economics it's basically worthless it in yeah. in many cases the power companies your power company would rather you not be exporting power in the middle of the day at all not because they hate solar but because it costs them money for you to export power that's right two things i wanted to bring up with the whole lower low feed in tariffs for solar unfair argument is that there are a couple of background issues a lot of the reason for that is solar installers and when they're quoting systems back in the day would use the highest feed in tariff quite often as the sort of case study and say hey joe and amy you're buying solar and this is the best feed-in tariff available in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane at the time. And I'm going to multiply it out for 10 years and hooray, you're going to be rich just from not changing your behavior at all, not changing when you use energy at all, just exporting like crazy and you don't need to do anything and you'll be getting lots of money credits off your electricity bill. And the reality is they should have known. This is not going to be the case for the long term. And it wasn't an accurate quote. And the real value of solar has always been self-consumption. So I'll show a graph on the screen of what I mean, of my power usage versus solar generation on a good sunny day. And the real win is realizing that you have a power plant on your roof and it's your power. And if you use it, it costs almost nothing. So you should be trying to run air conditioners and heating during that time, hot water heating as well, dishwashers, dryers for clothes if, if you need to, do lots of clothes washing if you have kids, all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe cook some stuff in the oven if you're working from home and you can just stick some stuff in and turn it on and have it ready to reheat at dinner time. So have you seen that problem in Victoria as well? People say, oh, but I was promised 15, 20 cent feed in tariffs forever. What happened to that? That's a good point. That problem is compounded by the way energy is built. People, as you said, the, the real value is in the avoided consumption, but the avoided consumption doesn't show on a bill. Mm. So you don't, the bill doesn't record what you didn't buy. Yep. And the value is in what you don't have to buy. So every kilowatt hour that you consume on your roof is a kilowatt hour you're not buying from the grid. Exactly. Um, but that's not showing on the bill. So people see that line item on the bill, which is kilowatt hours exported at some low feeding tariff and think, oh, that's the value of my solar. Therefore, I'm being ripped off. But in reality, what the bill should show, show you if it was that much larger number of kilowatt hours of avoided consumption, multiply that by the retail tariff 
And that's the real value of solar. And if there was a way of recording that on the bill, people would be a lot happier. Yes, exactly. It's like one of my local libraries. When I borrow books from there, it says you've borrowed books A, B and C and you've saved $50 compared to having to buy them. So hopefully that makes people realize, oh, it's not just convenient to walk down the road and borrow the books, but if I'd had to actually pay the retail price for the same books, it would have been $50 and I'm paying nothing. That's an interesting analogy. I, I think the heart of the misunderstanding when people say that it's a ripoff is it's around the difference between the feed-in tariff versus the retail tariff and what they contain. So when you're buying energy from a retailer, that retail tariff is not just the value of the energy. So people are broadly comfortable with the fact that we pay for energy from the grid, but we're also paying for the cost of the network and retail margins and other levies. But people might not be aware that cents per kilowatt hour charge has embodied in it things other than the value of the energy. So, for example, a typical retail tariff has to cover the retailers, the value of the energy, the retail margin, network charges, other levies, plus there's a risk premium. In other words, they have to build in a margin to cover for the price risk associated with peak price events. In other words, the difference between the, the wholesale price and the retail price doesn't always work out in their favour. Sometimes they're charging you less than what it's costing them during peak price events. And they have to allow for that. So, in other words, there, there's a price that comes with that convenience of having a, a predictable flat or two-tier price tariff. And so, but on the other hand, the feeding tariff that you get is only the average value of the energy. There is no other. That's all. So when someone says, oh, I'm being paid one cent and it's costing me 40 cents and it's not fair, it's an apples to oranges comparison. So people should, I think, appreciate that if they're selling energy into the market, then they, they should be paid at a wholesale rate because you're not selling it directly to your neighbour. So, so it's wholesale versus retail, plus a bunch of other things that make that direct price comparison not a reasonable one. You mentioned that people can get a lower tariff in the middle of the day. So that's a really good point. Increasingly... The wholesale price is a, a lower negative during the day. You can almost say that as an approximation, <laughs> if the sun's shining, the price is going to be lower negative, the wholesale price. So it's that start. I just had a look at the AEMO data dashboard, and you know, here we are in spring. It's mild weather, and unusually, the wholesale price here in Victoria was negative all night last night. So usually... People expect that there's a bit of a, a higher price in the, there's a morning mini peak and there's low prices during the day and there's a evening peak price. But this morning, the, the, I was really surprised when I had a look that the price has been negative since late last night. So must have been um, a lot of wind power or something. It, it, it's unusual to see that negative price is so early in the morning. So the amount of time during the day when a homeowner can reasonably expect to extract value by selling into the market a shrinking because as more renewables get in, installed, solar in particular, the daylight hours when there's decent positive prices are smaller. Hmm. I think it's definitely useful to discuss alternative energy uh, retailing arrangements like flow power and amber. I'm with Amber. I think you might be too. I'm going to try them out soon. I have covered Amber a lot recently, so I'm keen on learning about... If viewers want to learn about Amber, I'll put links in the description with details about that. But there's Flow Power, there's Ovo, there's uh, Glowbird. There's a few different options. Local Vaults, which actually does let you... It's kind of complicated and quite nerdy version of Amber, but it lets you sell power to the market in general, or a specific person, even a family member or a neighbor, as long yeah. as they're on local vaults as well. You mentioned there's, there's time, two categories there. One is retailers that offer that, what I gen, generally call a, a solar soaker tariff, where they give a fixed free load tariff during the day, as against other retailers like Amber and Flow that actually give you a market rate that varies dynamically. And so... Both, I think, are the way to go. That idea that we should be decoupled from 
the variable pricing, it, I think, needs to go away. People are used to paying a flat tariff, but I think increasingly, if we can, especially using apps, make it more convenient mm. to, to see dynamic pricing, it, it's a way of encouraging people to consume when it's cheap and sort of slow down your consumption when it's expensive. And in so doing, it directly reduces your own costs, but it also changes the dynamics of the market at a macro level as well. Because if lots and lots of people do this, then it tends to flatten out the price variation. At the moment, the wholesale market is very, I wouldn't say unstable, but there's very large price excursions that from very low. The regulated price cap is $40,300 per mm. megawatt hour. So that's $20.30 per kilowatt hour bought from the grid. That's the market price cap set by the AEMC. And likewise, there's a negative price cap. And so anyway, the point I was trying to make is the more people engage in responding to price signals, the less that price variation is going to be, which benefits everyone. In other words, it benefits people even if they're not doing this. So and I if, think if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's a sufficient fraction of people who are engaging in the market, then even those who aren't engaging in the market benefit from more stable wholesale prices. Definitely. And I think realistically, because most people want simplicity and don't want to think about power prices, if we can get even 10% or 15% of people moving to uh, more market linked options like low power, amber, local volts, and especially if they've got big batteries so they can shift energy back and forth to react to the pricing differences, yeah, it could smooth everything out, which is actually something I was going to bring up. Um, I'm getting a battery. I, I think it's being installed tomorrow, assuming everything goes well. Uh, have you got one yourself at your main residence? Yeah, I do. I okay. have a Fronius solar system with a BYD battery box. Yep. 10 kilowatt hours, which seems pretty reasonable at the time, but looking at what people are buying today, it looks pretty small. But yeah, average point, is about 20 think, kilowatt hours now. I don't think I answered your question before. But you asked about flow power. Yeah, so flow power and amber are the two that I know of that offer the dynamic pricing directly to the retail customers, mm. yeah. whereas people like Lowbird and Ovo give that sort of solar soaker tariff. So it used to be that flow power was giving that dynamic pricing to commercial customers and Amber was to all retail customers, but flow power I'm now offering to householders as well. I, I don't have any experience with flow, but I personally use Amber and it's been interesting. I've been with them about 10 months. Uh, as I said, I've got a battery and, and compared with the retailer I had before, it, it has saved me. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but... Five of the last 10 months, I've had negative bills. There are two other problems I see common with retailers as well. One is the, the so-called loyalty tax that people pay. It's not just electricity retailers, but insurance companies are also really bad at this. That It's reasonable that people get the best tariff. If they start off on the best tariff, they should stay on it. It should yes. be automatic. <laughs> Because I literally look every month or two because I know my provider at the Momentum Energy, which is a pretty good provider and it's owned by Tassie Hydro, which is why I choose yeah. it as opposed to the very big electricity companies, which own a lot of coal and I don't want to fund their coal. But even if I look on their portal, most of the time, every month or two, they change the price of what they're advertising and it's often better. And it's really easy to switch. I just go click, switch, yes, I agree, tick, done. But it should be automatic. No normal person is going to do that every month or two. Yeah. It's going to be a tiny percentage of people like me doing that. So there's that aspect, the loyalty tax, that people that aren't engaged don't get the best rate. And related to that is just the tariff structure complexity. Like a retailer might have a dozen different tariffs and knowing which, and they might change the name of them. And so the, the so-and-so tariff might have been a good one last year, but the tariff with the same name is, is actually not a good one this year. So it's just that artificial complexity that, that is a problem related to electricity retailing. So people need to focus on 
the real problems, not things like the feed-in tariff. Definitely. Personally, I think it's like mad that anyone thought that normal households would be well suited to demand tariffs. Even small businesses, to be honest, like a bakery or, or a tuck shop or whatever, demand tariffs, if they should be used at all, should be like aluminum smelters and, you know, giant industrial buildings, etc. Expecting normal people, like, for example, I have three houses in a row. I'm on time of use, so I have off peak and peak. Then the next house to me has flat rate because they're renters and their landlords have never installed solar or anything. So they've still just got the same price all day. Uh, even when price is really cheap, like now in the middle of the day, they're still paying higher, right? Um, and then the third house along, um, they got solar and they got switched to a demand tariff, even though it usually happens very poorly communicated or not communicated well at all. So they didn't even realize it was going to happen until they got a bill in a month or two. And it said, oh my God, that one day that you used heating and the oven at the same time is adding a huge extra amount to your bill. Um, what do you think about that? I personally think no homeowner should be forced to put on a, on a demand tariff. It should be opt-in at best for large battery owners. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the network's argument for demand tariffs um, at face value, it, it's reasonable, but when you look at the details and how it affects people, it's not. It's just going to alienate customers and uh, it, make them look even more greedy. Um, I yes, think I think in an industry which has like epically low customer trust, electricity industry, whether it's retailers yeah. or wholesalers. I don't understand. It's almost like someone said, Ooh, what would make someone hate Pete us more? Yes, let's do that instead. Or, I mean, that's probably going a bit far. Probably what yeah. people got together in a room and they're giant energy nerds like you and me, and they're very interested in all this and they know all the details and they thought, oh yeah, yeah. Normal people are like living in the matrix. They're constantly looking at prices and signals and deciding what to do. And they're super rational and demand prices will make sense. They'll remember not to turn on a kettle and an oven and a toaster at the same time. Let's do that. And the reality is people don't live in the matrix. 90 plus percent of people just want a boring electricity bill that is as low as possible. Yeah. I mean, Yes, people need to pay for their contribution to the to the use of the network, you know, the so-called size of the pipe. But yeah, I think demand tariffs are a poor way to do that. Um, yeah, but, yeah, that, that's a nerdy discussion that perhaps uh, is is for another day. Thanks for liking, subscribing, and sharing my videos. It really helps me make more videos like this for you. And have a look at the suggested videos up above. I'm pretty sure you'll like those as well. Thanks and see you later.